Welcome back to Fundamentally Mormon. I'm your host, Mark Lichtenwalter. Today we're going to be reading the second to last chapter of Jesus Was Married. Chapter 8 will be on pages 79 through 99. We'll listen to the reader program first, which is 48 minutes long. And then I will read it with commentary. After I'm done posting this to iTunes, I will post it to my Facebook at facebook.com forward slash L-A-Z-U-R-U-S 1977. Thank you for listening. Jesus and his posterity, chapter 8 of Jesus was married, pages 79 to 99 the true Messiah spoken of by all the ancient prophets was the personification and representation of all that is true and noble. One of man's most honorable estates is that of marriage and his family. The very thought of singleness and barrenness is generally repulsive and certainly not according to God's law which commands mankind to be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. General 128 Living things are designed to grow and be productive. One of the most popular misconceptions about Jesus was his manliness. The common Christian has been taught about a Jesus with the femininity which is embarrassing if not revolting to anyone who understands his true character. The real Messiah labored and toiled with a genuine manly dignity. He walked many miles, he climbed and preached upon the mountain sides. He ate the most common food, and that among the poorest publicans and the worst of sinners. He wielded a whip across the backs of temple thieves and overturned their tables. Then with a dignity, majesty, and in a self-control that demanded the utmost strength, he silently and patiently withstood the beatings the spitting and the sordid insults of a depraved humanity. Finally, he carried a burdensome cross through sweat and blood on the road to Calvary and suffered a torturous death between two thieves. 80. This is not the character personified in the stained glass of the cathedrals, robed in costly garments, and glorious with a delicate and effeminate appearance. The Christ we adore and revere was a real man, strong in character, body and mind. He was a man among men, a king of kings, and a lord of lords. Yet he understood by experience every feeling, every weakness and strength, of each mortal man. He lived like a man, he understood and spoke as a man, but he possessed the dignity and wisdom of a god. This was the real Jesus, the true Messiah, the perfect example, Among man's greatest honors and blessings is his home. For the security, the love, and the possessions of a family, man will make every sacrifice, toil to unending endurance, or fight upon any battlefield. The family is man's most valuable treasure, and the dearest to his heart. The basis of dignity and glory is for a man to have a continuation of seed children that will revere his life and continue his name. No blessing could have been more precious to Abraham than the promise that his seed would become as numerous as the stars and the sands of the sea. If Abraham was so honored because of his righteousness, then it is only reasonable that Jesus should also be granted a similar blessing. If mortal men may be blessed with such a numerous posterity, then how much more deserving should be the Christ? Did Jesus have children? Paul said that Jesus took upon him the seed of Abraham, Heb. 
216, which means simply that he continued the lineage and posterity of Abraham. If these things have power to disturb the pure mind, we apprehend that even greater troubles than these may arise before mankind learn all the particulars of Christ's incarnation, how and by whom he was begotten, the character of the relationships formed by that act, the number of wives and children he had, and all 81 other circumstances with which he was connected, and by which he was tried and tempted in all things like unto man. Whatever may prove to be the facts in the case, it certainly would exhibit a great degree of weakness on the part of anyone to indulge in fears and anxieties about that which he has no power to control. Facts still remain facts, whether kept or revealed. If there is a way pointed out by which all beings who come into this world can lay the foundation for rule, and an ever-ending increase of kingdoms and dominions, by which they can become gods, we are as willing the Lord Jesus Christ should enjoy them all as any other being, and we believe the descendants of such a sire would glory in ascribing honor and power to him as their God. The Apostle informs us that those who are redeemed shall be like Jesus. Not to say, however, that they shall be wifeless and childless, and without eternal affections. Samuel W. Richards, Milstar, 15. 825. There is a law of procreation just as binding, just as eternal, and just as consistent in its demands and blessings as the law of baptism. The purpose and scope of marriage is to bear children. To say that Jesus did not need to comply with the law of marriage, and the propagation of children is as foolish as to say that he did not need to comply with the demands of any other law of the gospel. Jesus Christ never omitted the fulfilling of a single law that God has made known for the salvation of the children of men. It would not have done for him to have come and obeyed one law and neglected or rejected another. He could not consistently do that and then say to mankind, follow me. Joseph F. Smith, Milstar, 62, 97, 82, Jesus honored and obeyed every law of the gospel including marriage and raising a posterity. Indeed, it is through obedience to this divine law that gives the greatest honor to man, for it was the first law and commandment given to men. Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law, and the first positive commandment of the Bible according to rabbinical law, Nemonides, Minyan Hametzmet, p. 212, is the propagation of the human race. The Jewish morality insists that a man who does not assume the social responsibility for the continuation of society, lives a life that is not complete. Rabbi Hirsch, My Religion, p. 44. Jewish tradition and rabbinical law declare the promised Messiah is to be a married high priest with children. To better understand human nature with its weaknesses, problems, and trials, a high priest was required to be married and raise a family. In such a position he could, from his own experience, be better prepared to give counsel and advice in assisting others who may have similar problems. With the experience of marriage, and the raising of a large family, coupled with the inspiration of heaven, he then was qualified to act in that holy calling for his fellow men. Although through many centuries, priests and popes disregarded the law of marriage and substituted the doctrine of celibacy, the supposed first pope, the Apostle Peter, was a married man. Matt 8, 14 MK 1, 30 LK 4, 38 Indeed, he may well have been a polygamist rather than a celibate, for he had two homes, one in Bethsaida, John 1.44, and another home in Capernaum, Mark 1.29. Now, if there be a perversion in the original history of the lives of the apostles, how much more had it been tampered in the life of the true Messiah? For years before Christ's coming, the Jews believed in a Messiah who would have children. 
83, the Messiah will die, and his son will become king in his stead, and there will be no immortality, but the people will live much longer. The Missile Idea in Jewish History, Greenstone, p. 147. After nearly 2,000 years of historical juggling, true facts will sound like fairy tales. American history, in an enlightened age with only a couple hundred years to draw from, is being constantly re-exposed to the amazement of her citizens. How delicately we must expose the truth from many, many centuries. In 1853 the Apostle Osun had dared to deliver a lecture revealing incidents in the life of Christ which affirmed his marriage and children. This news scattered like wildfire throughout the country and editors made literary war upon the Apostle. Said Urson Hyde a few months later, I discovered that some of the Eastern papers represent me as a great blasphemer, because I said, in my lecture on marriage, at our last conference that Jesus Christ was married at Cana of Galilee, that Mary, Martha, and others were his wives, and that he begat children. All that I have to say in reply to that charge is this, they worship a saviour that is too pure and holy to fulfil the commands of his father. I worship one that is just pure and holy enough to fulfil all righteousness. Not only the righteous law of baptism, but the still more righteous and important law to multiply and replenish the earth. Startle not at this, for even the father himself honoured that law by coming down to Mary without a natural body, and begetting a son? And if Jesus beget children he only did that which he had seen his father do? Apostle Ozen Hyde, J.D. 2, 210, 84 The ancient prophet Isaiah had written more on the life and the expected Messiah than any other prophet. In one of these prophecies he said the great Redeemer would see his children. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Isaiah 53, 10 This scripture indicates that when Jesus would be making his soul an offering for sin, that he would see his children. No doubt this event did occur, which would make his offering more heart-rending and the trial more severe. Perhaps Luke recorded this very event. For at the time that Jesus was being taken to the cross at Calvary, Luke said, There followed him a great company of people, and of women which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves, and for your children. Luke 23 27-29 These women were wives and mothers who bewailed and lamented because Jesus was going to the cross. But, Jesus knew that his mortal mission was nearly over, it was the end of the suffering for him, but it was not the end of the trials for those mothers and their children. And, Jesus continued to explain their situation by adding, If they do these things in the green tree, what shall they do in the dry? Jesus knew the sorrows that would continue for those women and children, because the persecutors would not stop at the death of Jesus. They would continue to destroy his children, his relatives and his disciples. Then said Jesus, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear, because the destroyers would, like Herod, seek their destruction. Persecution became so severe that every apostle, with the exception of John, and most of the disciples were killed. 85. Man's honor and glory is obtained by woman. Alone and single, man fades into insignificance, but through women and children, his glory is extended and perpetuated. For this reason Paul said that the woman is the glory of the man. I call. 11. 7. Jesus was not the exception to this principle. Before he died he said to the Father, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son may also glorify thee. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. John 17. 
1, 4. The Lord continued to reveal further light on this subject in the revelation to the prophet. For they are given unto him to multiply and replenish the earth, according to my commandment, and to fulfill the promise which was given by my father before the foundation of the world, and for their exaltation in the eternal worlds, that they might bear the souls of men. For herein is the work of my father continued, that he might be glorified. This promise is yours also because ye are of Abraham, and the promise was made unto Abraham. And by this law is the continuation of the works of my father, wherein he glorifieth himself. Go ye, therefore, and do the works of Abraham. Enter into my law and ye shall be saved. D. Ampersand C. 132, 63, 31, 32. Hence, God is glorified by the commandment to multiply and replenish the earth. It is evident Jesus had a posterity by his admission that he glorified the Father on earth. The grand blessing of honor which was given to Abraham was his family and his posterity. This was the glory of Abraham. 86. But to continue with the scripture of Isaiah, what did the old prophet mean when he said, speaking of Christ, he shall see his seed, prolong his ace, etc.? Did Jesus consider it necessary to fulfill every righteous command or requirement of his father? He most certainly did. This he witnessed by submitting to baptism under the hands of John. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, said he. Was it God's commandment to man, in the beginning, to multiply and replenish the earth? None can deny this, neither that it was a righteous command. For upon in obedience to this, depended the perpetuity of our race. Did Christ come to destroy the law or the prophets, or to fulfill them? He came to fulfill. Did he multiply, and did he see his seed? Did he honor his father's law by complying with it, or did he not? Others may do as they like, but I will not charge our Savior with neglect or transgression in this or any other duty. Person Hyde, J.D. 4, 260 When Christ came in the meridian of time, he came to fulfill all of the gospel laws. He further fulfilled all of the ancient prophecies concerning the life of the promised Messiah. Isaiah the prophet saw the Messiah seated upon the throne of the temple. In the year that King Uzziah died I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Isa. 6, 1. In this instance the train was not a robe, for it filled the temple. This train implies more than just disciples. The term referred to relations or family members, and it was the interpretation taken by President Brigham Young. 87. The scripture says that he, the Lord, came walking in the temple, with his train. I do not know who they were unless his wives and children. B. Young, J.D. 13, 309. That he did take upon himself the responsibilities of a family is also inferred by the Apostle Paul who said that he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Person Pratt refers to this scripture as follows. From the passage in the 45th Psalm, it will be seen that the great Messiah who was the founder of the Christian religion, was a polygamist as well as the patriarch Jacob and the prophet David from whom he descended according to the flesh. Paul says concerning Jesus, Verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Heb 2, 16 Abraham the polygamist, being a friend of God, the Messiah chose to take upon himself his seed, and by marrying many honorable wives to himself, show to all future generations that he approbated the plurality of wives under the Christian dispensation, as well as under the dispensations in which his polygamist ancestors lived. 
We have now clearly shown that God the Father had a plurality of wives, one or more being in eternity, by whom he begat our spirits as well as the Spirit of Jesus his firstborn, and another being upon the earth by whom he begat the tabernacle of Jesus, as his only begotten in this world. We have also proved most clearly that the Son followed the example of his Father and became the great bridegroom to whom king's daughters and many honorable wives were to be married. We have also proved that both God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ inherit their wives in eternity as well as in time, and that God the Father has already begotten many thousand millions of sons and daughters and sent them 88 into this world to take tabernacles, and that God the Son has the promise that of the increase of his government there shall be no end, it being expressly declared that the children of one of his queens should be made princes in all the earth. Cease Arm 45, 16, Earth and Pride, the Seer, p. 172. As Jesus entered the Garden of Jethsman, he knew of the conspiracy of death that loomed upon the near horizon. Diabolical men and demons were allying their means and powers to destroy the prospects of the Son of God. And with this premonition, Jesus sank to his knees and cried. No mortal man, no human heart ever felt the anguish, the sorrow, and the despair that came from that little garden that lonely night. And why? Because he prayed and felt as a mortal man, as a husband and a father. He loved his home as dear as any man ever loved a home. He knew the warmth of a family's love beside the fireplace, the smiles and laughter of his children the tender embrace of a loving wife. Was there ever a blessing or a joy in a human heart that he should be deprived of? And conversely, was there ever a sorrow, a pain, or an anguish that other men had suffered that he too must not share? With the seeds of mortality coursing through the veins of Jesus, he had experienced the emotions and feelings of every other mortal, yet with a nature that was divine he neither sinned nor erred. No mortal was ever more entitled to a home and family than he. No man had greater reason to remain alive than did Jesus, and for these he prayed. Death could deprive him of all of these deserving blessings. In a gushing of tears and sweat he was pleading to his father for a continuation of his life. He loved his wives, his children and his disciples. And in the despair of leaving them, he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. In the darkness of the night and the blackness of his future, he attempted to arouse his apostles three times to assist him in this petition for his life. And he cried, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I would but what thou wilt. Mark 14.36 89. His soul was torn between the affectionate ties on the earth and the will of his Father in heaven. But, like many of God's prophets who had been robbed of their homes and families to perish in the prime of life, so too Jesus must suffer through this same trial and temptation. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like that we are, yet without sin. Heb. 4, 15. Attention must again be drawn to the revelation of March 1839 to the Prophet Joseph Smith during his incarceration in the Liberty Jail. The Lord indicates this trial of Joseph's was for his good and would give him experience, then indicates that he too had undergone the same heartfelt sorrow of being separated from his offspring, and also much worse. If thou art accused with all manner of false accusations, if thine enemies fall upon thee, if they tear thee from the society of thy father and mother and brethren and sisters, and if with a drawn sword thine enemies tear thee from the bosom of thy wife, and of thine offspring, and thine elder son, all that at six years of age, shall cling to thy garments, and shall say, My father, my father, why can't you stay with us? Oh, Nay, father, what are the men going to do with you? And if then he shall be thrust from thee by the sword, 
and thou be dragged to prison, and thine enemies prowl around thee like wolves for the blood of the Lamb. Know thou my son, that all these things shall give thee experience, and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? The Ampersand C, 122, 6, 7, 8. Understanding the feelings of the heart can only be obtained by experience. As the taste of salt and sugar cannot be known but by the taste of the tongue, so also must the joys and sorrows of the heart be known by experience. Jesus knew happiness, sorrow, disappointment, ninety, and every other emotion and feeling of the husband, a father, and a man. He experienced them all that he might understand our feelings and lead us to eternal life. And in the light of new revelation and new archaeological findings these little known facts are finding their way to discovery. In 1875 an archaeologist by the name of Guinea discovered these facts in ancient records. The written commentary of the learned M's viadly are most revealing. Did Jesus have children? There seems to be evidence that such was the case. In 1873 M. Clement Guinea discovered near Bethany on the Mount of Offense certain sarcophagi of extremely ancient times. On these were small crosses, but none of the usual symbols of Jewish burials, which leaves no doubt of the religion of the persons whose remains were preserved in them. M. Clement Guinea, writing of these discoveries in the Palestine Exploration Fund Quarterly, 1874, 7-10, notes the following to have been buried there, Salom, wife of Judah, Judah, son of Eliza, Lazarus, Eliza, the son of Nathan, Martha, daughter of Pesach, Simeon, son of Jesus, Salom Zion, daughter of Simeon. Other sarcophagi had been destroyed earlier. Concerning them writes Clement Guinea, by singular coincidence, which from the first struck me very forcibly, these inscriptions, found close to the Bethany Road, and very near the site of the village, contain nearly all the names of the personages in the gospel scene which belonged to the place. Eliza, Lazarus, Simon, Martha. A host of other coincidences occur at the site of all of these evangelical names. The Simeon, son of Jesus, was called in one of the inscriptions, the priest, H. Cohen, and M. Clement Guinea concluded. This Simeon might very well be the second bishop of Jerusalem. But then would arise. The grave, 91, question of the marriage of Christian priests since Simeon has a daughter named Salem Zion. M. Clement Guinea's French name suggests him to be Catholic, and bound to the doctrines of celibacy. However, the first 15 bishops of Jerusalem were circumcised Jews, and the earlier ones, at least, certainly obeyed the marriage commandments. It seems the only reason Clement Guinea did not candidly state his beliefs was the question of a married clergy for throughout his article he suggests for Simeon to have been the Bishop of Jerusalem. He promised to write a complete paper on the subject when he had more carefully examined all the find. It was an important find from the standpoint of archaeology, for it was the first actual discovery of the name Martha which would alone be sufficient to make this collection important from an exegetic point of view. Yet, his promised paper was never published. Why? Was it because a full study of the find disclosed that this, Simeon the son of Jesus, was the Bishop of Jerusalem? I fully believe this to be the case. Orthodox Christians have purposely destroyed valuable historical evidences which would prove embarrassing to them. That such was probably the case here is suggested by the fact that several ancient writers imply that Simeon the Bishop of Jerusalem and president of the church, died c. 106 was of the family of Jesus. 
It would be only natural for Jesus' son, when he was old enough to succeed James, the brother of the Lord, on his death, to the presidency of the church. In all probability Simeon was a son of Jesus and Martha, and was that child who appeared at the crucifixion. M's by Adley, Ph.D. Other ancient manuscripts may have been found which would contribute additional evidence concerning the marriage and family of Jesus. However, our present attitudes forbid validity and disclosure of such evidence because 92 they tear asunder all of our homespun traditional teachings. Historical sources may yet someday bring further light and information on this subject. From an ecclesiastical point of view we know that Jesus came to honor, teach and obey the laws of the priesthood. And when Jesus became an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, Heb. 6, 20, he obeyed every law and ordinance pertaining to that order and priesthood. Not only did he sustain those laws, but he became the perfect example for others to follow in like manner. One of the primary laws of this priesthood order was for the priests to bear children. It was essential for men who bore the priesthood to have a continuation of seed by bearing children under that covenant. A high priest who had no children was considered accursed, while those who had a numerous posterity were called blessed. The children who were born under the covenant of the priesthood were blessed with a fatherly or patriarchal blessing. Prophecies were uttered upon their heads for their future and the future of their posterity, for many generations. Isaiah prophesied concerning the posterity of Jesse, father of David, and that from his loins should come someone known as the stem, another as the rod, and one as the branch. The identity of these persons was sought for by the prophet Joseph Smith, who inquired of the Lord. The disclosure concerning the stem was made known in the following revelation. Who is the stem of Jesse spoken of in the LST, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th verses of the 11th chapter of Isaiah? Verily thus saith the Lord, It is Christ. D. Ampersand C. 113, 1-2. Since Christ was identified as the stem, it is interesting to note that the stem was to have posterity, according to Isaiah. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Isa. 11, 1, 93. This is evidence that the stem or the Christ would have children, because these great servants known as the rod and the branch were to come forth through his lineage. The rod has been identified as the prophet Joseph Smith. Prophecy designates the rod as one who would hold the keys of the kingdom through Nansen and for the gathering of my people in the last days. D. Ampersand C. 113, 6, and Isaiah said that he should be the means of establishing an ensign of the people, to which shall the Gentiles seek. Is a 11, 10, since Joseph Smith did hold the keys of the kingdom in the last ace, D. Ampersand C. 64, 5, 65, 2, 115, 19, and was that rod from the loins of the stem of Jesse, he would have the blood of Abraham, Jesse, and the Savior, according to the testimony of Scripture and Revelation. Lieutenant would be evident that Joseph Smith should also know these facts. The prophet did understand them, and more, but he was reluctant to tell them because of the traditions and ideologies of modern Christianity. Once he hinted, Would to God, brethren, I could tell you who I am. Would to God I could tell you what I know. But you would call it blasphemy, and want to take my life. Joseph Smith, Life of B.C. Kimball, P. 333, 
but the royal blood lineage of the prophets and the Savior was not confined to the few select individuals described by Isaiah. Other notable leaders, such as those chosen to assist in the restoration of the gospel in these last days, were also instilled with the blood and the spirit of their Lord, and these valiant souls were commissioned to establish this ensign for the work of that gathering of my people in the last days. Among the notable and valiant leaders of this last dispensation was President O.C. Kimball. He was a 94 noble man, a prophet, and a true apostle of Jesus Christ who possessed all of the powers and gifts of the ancient apostles. The story of his life, his character, and his labors was patterned after the similitude of the Savior. The spiritual gifts and endowments which God had blessed him with became so abundantly manifest that thousands flocked to hear and see this latter-day prophet. On one occasion in England, crowds of people greeted him with flowers, songs, and offerings of kindness. The Apostle Osan F. Whitney commented on this occasion by making a parallel in the life of the Savior. A rare scene, indeed, and a suggestive one, for the parallel of which the mind must leap backward nigh 2,000 years. On the next day much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. So was it with this servant of Christ, this brother of Jesus in the British Isles. The hireling, the Pharisees of Christendom, prevailed nothing. The word went after him, whole villages at a sweep, singing praises, and shouting in tones of rapture. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. There was divine harmony in all this. In his character, manner and methods, we say it reverently, there was much of the Christ, the might of the lion, with the meekness of the lamb. His, also, was the Saviour's lineage. In his heart a kindred spirit, in his veins the self-same blood. Where causes are similar, should there not spring similar results? Life of O.C. Kimball, P. 185, 95, O.C. Kimball understood the paternal nature of this ancient blood royalty. At a conference in 1857 he was impressed to publicly reveal information concerning this sacred lineage and perhaps he knew the time had arrived when these things should be made known for the light and understanding of the saints. If they could comprehend and treasure this information it would inspire them to live a more saintly life. Are you ever going to be prepared to see God, Jesus Christ, his angels, or comprehend his servants, unless you take a faithful and prayerful course? Did you actually know Joseph Smith? No. Do you know Brother Brigham? No. Do you know Brother Heber? No, you do not. Do you know the Twelve? You do not. If you did, you would begin to know God, and learn that those men who are chosen to direct and counsel you are near kindred to God and Jesus Christ, for the keys, power, and authority of the kingdom of God are in that lineage. Bussy, Kimball, JD4, 248. The prophet Joseph Smith had previously and privately revealed some of these things to a few select individuals. It was in the early 1840s that Joseph made a similar disclosure. While visiting with Zena, she related a conversation that occurred between her and her sister Efsha upon events in Novu, where the prophet Joseph Smith sealed her, sister Efsha, to Judge Adams of Springfield, Illinois. The prophet stated to her, Repsha, that Judge Adams was a literal descendant of Jesus Christ. The judge died in Novu and Sister Repsha, his wife, who has been married before to Repsha, died at Hill Creek, Utah. 
Oliver B. Huntington Journal, P. 259-96 in a solemn assembly held in the Salt Lake Temple, July 2, 1899, more information pertaining to the descendants of Christ was divulged. The Apostle George Q. Cannon made the disclosure after which the President of the Church, Lorenzo Snow, confirmed his statement. President George Q. Cannon also spoke on the law of tithing. Among the other things, he said, there are those in this audience who are descendants of the old twelve apostles, and shall I say it, yes, descendants of the Savior himself. His seed is represented in this body of men. Following Perez, Cannon, President Snow arose and said that what bro? Cannon had stated respecting the literal descendants among this company of the old apostles and the Savior himself is true, the Savior's seed is represented in this body of men. Journal of Perez Roger Lawson, 374-375 But Kimball, Young, Adams and other apostles were not the only exceptions in possessing the literal blood of Christ. Other members of the church and congregation were also descendants of this grand royalty. There are men in this congregation who are descendants of the ancient twelve apostles and shall I say it, of the Son of God himself, for he had seed, and in the right time they shall be known. Anthony W. Ivan's Journal, P. 21. What became of the descendants and the children of Jesus? Would they not, as Abraham's seed be a blessing to all the nations of the earth? According to prophecy, the Shoahist seed of the earth will be gathered in the last days to prepare for the second coming of the Savior. The Apostolos and Hyde comments on this blood lineage. 97. We say it was Jesus Christ who was married, to be brought into the relation whereby he could see his seed, before he was crucified. Has he indeed passed by the nature of angels, and taken upon himself the seed of Abraham, to die without leaving a seed to bear his name on the earth? No. But when the secret is fully out, the seed of the blessed shall be gathered in, in the last ace, and he who is not the blood of Abraham flowing in his veins, who has not one particle of the saviors in him, I am afraid is a stereotype Gentile, who will be left out and not be gathered in the last ace. For I tell you it is the chosen of God, the seed of the blessed, that shall be gathered. I do not despise to be called a son of Abraham, if he had a dozen wives, or to be called a brother, a son, a child of the Savior, if he had Mary, and Martha, and several others, as wives. And though he did cast seven devils out of one of them, it is all the same to me. Well, then, he shall see his seed, and he shall declare his generation, for he was cut off from the earth. I shall say here, that before the Savior died, he looked upon his own natural children, as we look upon ours. He saw his seed, and immediately afterwards he was cut off from the earth. But who shall declare his generation? They had no father to hold them in honorable remembrance. They passed into the shades of obscurity, never to be exposed to mortal eye as the seed of the Blessed One. For no doubt had they been exposed to the eye of the world, those infants might have shared the same fate as their children in Jerusalem in the days of Herod, when all their children were ordered to be slain under such an age, with the hopes of slaying the infant Savior. History is replete with circumstances of neck or nothing politicians dying their hands in the blood of those who stood in their way to the throne or to power. 98. That seed has had its influence upon the chosen of God in the last days. The same spirit inspires them that inspires their father, who bled and died upon the cross after the manner of the flesh. Erzin Hyde, JD2, 82-83. Two years later this learned apostle again continued to expound on the blessings of this chosen seed. Abraham was chosen of God for the purpose of raising up a chosen seed, and a peculiar people unto his name. G. 
Jesus Christ was sent into the world for a similar purpose, but upon a more extended scale. Christ was the seed of Abraham, so reckoned. To these, great promises were made, one of which was, that in Abraham, and his seed, which was Christ, all the families of the earth should be blessed. When? When the ungodly or those not of their seed should be cut off from the earth, and no family remaining on earth except their own seed. Then in Abraham and in Christ, all the families and kindreds of the earth will be blessed, Satan bound, and the millennium fully come. Then the meek will inherit the earth, and God's elect reign undisturbed, at least, for one thousand years. Is there no way provided for those to come into this covenant relation who may not possess in their veins, any of the blood of Abraham or of Christ? Yes. By doing the works of Abraham and of Christ in the faith of Abraham and of Christ, not in unbelief and unrighteousness, like the wicked world who have damned themselves in their own corruption and unbelief. Urson Hyde, JD4, 260. What would today's ministers of Christianity say about Jesus if he came into our society traveling with a large group of women? What would they say if they saw him eating and staying overnight in the home of a couple of 99 young women? Our modern ministers think that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute and consider Christ's association with her in that relationship as more acceptable than if she were his wife. It takes a special bending of the mind to reach some of the conclusions of our counterfeit Christian ministry. It is certainly more respectful to Christ to consider his association with Mary as a wife rather than a prostitute, and scriptural evidence leans more toward that conclusion. It is strange indeed to think that Jesus should be able to understand and obey, or fulfill, every law and commandment of God, yet be exempt from obeying that law which commands man to multiply and replenish the earth. 100. Jesus was married. Chapter 8 Jesus and his posterity. Pages 79 through 99. When the two, true Messiah spoken of by all the ancient prophets was personif- the personification and representation of all that is true and noble. One of man's most honorable estates is that of marriage and his family. The very thought of singleness and barrenness is generally generally repulsive and certainly not according to God's law, which commands mankind to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 
Living things are designed to grow and be productive. One of the most popular misconceptions about Jesus was his manliness. The common Christian has been taught about a Jesus with a femininity which is embarrassing if not revolting to anyone who actually understands his true character. The Messiah labored and toiled with a genuine manly dignity. He walked many miles. He climbed and preached upon the mountainside. He ate the most common food and that among the poorest publicans and the worst of sinners. He wielded a crop, a a whip across the backs of temple thieves and overturned their tables. Then with a dignity, majesty, and inner self-control that demanded the utmost strength, he silently and patiently withstood the beatings and spitting and the sword's assaults of a depraved humanity. Finally, he he carried a burdensome cross through the sweat, blood, and blood on the road to Calvary and suffered a tortuous death between two thieves. Page 80. This is not the character personified in in the stainless glass of cathedrals, robed in costly garments and glorious with a delicate and effeminate appearance. The Christ we adore and revere was a real man, strong in character, body and mind. He was a man among men, a king of kings and a lord of lords. Yet he understood by experience every feeling, every weakness and strength and of, of each mortal man. He lived like a man. He understood and spoke as a man, but he possessed the dignity and wisdom of a God. This was the real Jesus, the true Messiah, the perfect example. Among men's greatest honors and blessings is his home for the security, the love, and the possession of a family. Man will make every sacrifice, toil, toil to unending endurance or fight upon any battlefield. The family is man's most valuable treasure and the dearest to his heart. The basis of dignity and glory is for a man to have a continuation of seed, children that will revere his life and continue his name. No blessing could have been more precious to Abraham than the promise that his seed would become as numerous as the stars of heaven or the sands of the sea. If Abraham was so honored because of his righteousness, then it is only reasonable that Jesus should also be granted a similar blessing. If mortal man may be blessed with such a numerous posterity, then how much more deserving should be the Christ? Did Jesus have children? Paul said that Jesus took upon him the seed of Abraham, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16 which means simply that he continued the language or the lineage and posterity of Abraham if these things have power to disturb the pure mind we apprehend that he are that even greater troubles than these may arise before mankind learn all of the particulars of Christ's incarnation how and by whom he was begotten, 
the character of the relationships formally by the acts, the number of wives and children he had and all other circumstances which he has connect or was connected well, on page 81 and by which he was tried and tempted in all things like unto man whatever may prove to be the case in the facts in this case it would certainly it certainly would inhibit a great degree of weakness on the part of anyone to indulge in fears and anxieties about that which he has no possession or power or which he has no power to control Facts still remain facts, whether kept in secret. Oh, I'm sorry. Facts still remain facts, whether kept or revealed. If there is a way pointed out by which all beings who come into this world can lay the foundation for rule and a never-ending inheritance of king kingdoms and dominions by which they can become gods we are as willing as the Lord Jesus Christ should enjoy them all as any other being and we believe that descendants of such a sire would glory in ascribing honor and power to him as their god so we're 11% done with the reading for right now, and I need to go back to sleep. So I'm going to finish this recording later, but for you, I'll be right back. So uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I think I'm going to just keep reading just to the next page so I know where I'm at when I come back. That way I won't screw anything up, but I'm definitely having a day. So the apostle informs us that those who are redeemed shall be like Jesus, not to say, however, that they shall be wifeless or childless and without eternal affection. Samuel W. Richards, Millennial Star, Volume 15, page 825. For there is the law of procreation, just and binding, just as eternal and just as consistent in its de- demands and blessings as the laws of baptism. The purpose and scope of marriage is to bear children to say that Jesus did not need to comply with the law of marriage and the propagation of children is as foolish as to say that he did not need to comply with the demands of any other law of the gospel. Jesus never omitted the fulfilling of a single law that God has made known for the salvation of the children of men it would not have done it would not have done him for him to have in it would not have done for him to have come and obeyed the one law and neglected or rejected another he could not consistently do that and then say to mankind follow me Joseph F. Smith, Millennial Star, Volume 62, page 97, or on page 82. Jesus honored and obeyed every law of the gospel, including marriage and raising posterity or children. Indeed, 
It is through obedience to this divine law that gives the greatest honor to man. For this was the first law and commandment given to men. Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law, which once again, when, when in Hebrew understanding, when someone says that they fulfilled the law, that means they live it perfectly. The first positive commandment of the Bible according to the rabbinical law, and quote Maimonides, Minyan Ha Mitznet, page 212. Is the propagation of the human race? I don't know why the quote was in the middle there. Let me just read that again. The first p- positive commandment of the Bible according to the rabbinical law, which was given by Maimonides, is the propagation of the human race. The Jewish morality insists that a man who does not assume the social responsibility for the continuation of the society lives a life that is not complete. Rabbi Hirsik my religion, page 44. So, um, if Jesus did not live, if Jesus remained a bachelor, as so many believe after Catholicism and Rome hijacked Christianity, you would have seen it in the New Testament where the Jews would have given him crap about that too, but they never did. Because he was married. They couldn't give him crap about it because he wasn't a bachelor. He did have children. They could have said he was cursed if he didn't have children, but they knew that he did. Unfortunately, it was swept from the record by the Romans when they hijacked early Christianity. The Jewish tradition and rabbinical law declare the promised Messiah is to be a married high priest with children. To better understand human nature with its weaknesses, problems, and trials, a high priest was required to be married and raise a family. In such a position, he could, from his own experience, be better prepared to give counsel and advice in assisting others who may have had similar problems with the experience of marriage and the raising of a large family coupled with the inspiration of heaven, he then was qualified to act in that holy calling for his fellow men. Although through many centuries, priests and popes disregarded the law of marriage and substituted the doctrine of celibacy, the supposed first pope, the Apostle Peter was a married man. Matthew chapter 8 verse 14, Mark chapter 1 verse 30, and Luke chapter 4 verse 38. Indeed, he may well have been a polygamist rather than a celibate, for he had two homes, one Bethsaida according to John chapter 1 verse 44, and another in Capernaum according to Mark chapter 1, verse 29. Now, if there be a perversion in the original history of the lives of the apostles, how much more had it been tampered with in the life of the true Messiah? For years before Christ's coming, the Jews believed in the Messiah would have children. Page 83. The Messiah will die and his son will become king in his stead, and there will be no immortality, but the people will live much longer. And that is according to Greenstone in his book, The Messiah Idea in Jewish History, page 147. After nearly 2,000 years of historical juggling, true facts will sound like fairy tales. American history in an enlightened age with only a couple hundred years to draw from is being constantly re-exposed to the amazement of her citizens. How delicately 
we must expose the truth from many, many uh, centuries. In 1853, the apostle Orson Hyde dared to deliver a lecture revealing the incidents in the life of Christ which affirmed his marriage and children. This news scattered like wildfire throughout the country and editors made literally war, literary war upon the apostle. Said Orson Hyde a few months later, quote, I discovered that some of the Eastern papers represent me as a great blasphemer because I said in my lecture on marriage at our last conference that Jesus Christ was married at Cana of Galilee and that Mary, Martha, and others were his wives and that he begat children. All that I have to say in reply to that charge is this. They worship a savior that is too pure and holy to fulfill the commandments of his father. I worship one that is just pure and holy enough to fulfill all righteousness. Not only the righteous law of baptism, but the still more righteous law and important law to multiply and replenish the earth. Startle not at this, for even the Father himself honored that lie by coming down to Mary without a natural body and begetting a son. And if Jesus begot children, he only did that which he had seen his Father do. And quote the Apostle Orson Hyde, Journal of Discourses, Volume 2, page 210, or on page 84 for those of you reading along. The ancient prophet Isaiah had written more on the life and the expected Messiah than any other prophet. In one of these prophecies, he said the great Redeemer would see his children. Quote, When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. This scripture indicates that when Jesus would be making his soul an offering for sin, that he would see his children. No doubt this event did occur, which would make his offering more heartrending and the trial more severe. Perhaps Luke recorded this very event, for at the time that Jesus was being taken to the cross, at Calvary, Luke said, quote, There followed him a great company of people and of women which also bewailed and lamented to him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Luke chapter 23, verses 27 through 29. These women were wives and mothers who we welled and lamented because Jesus is going to the cross. But Jesus knew that his mortal mission was nearly over. It was the end of the suffering for him, but it was not the end of the trials for these mothers and their children. And Jesus continued to explain their situation by adding, If they do these things in the green tree, what shall they do in the dry Jesus knew the sorrows that would continue for those women and children because their persecutors would not stop at the death of Jesus. They would continue to destroy his children and his relatives and his disciples. Then said Jesus, the days are coming in which they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear because the destroyers would like Herod seek their destruction. Persecution became so severe that every apostle, with the exception of John, and most of the disciples were killed. Or on page 85. I just wanted to say something real quick. So, Joseph of Arimathea was the uncle of Mary the mother of Jesus. So he was Jesus Christ's great uncle. 
And we know that he was part of the Sanhedrin, but that he was also a merchant man. And that he went up into what is now considered Scotland to obtain tin to bring it down for the bronze and for uh, different reasons. But he would go up and he would bring down bronze. Now, after Jesus was murdered, the family of Jesus, along with his wives and his children, were worried that that Rome and the Jews would come after them as well. So Joseph of Arimathea went up beyond Hadrian's Wall out of the Roman Empire into what is now considered modern-day Scotland, and the posterity of Jesus is in that place. Many people that have the blood of the Scottish in them have the blood of Jesus within them. So continuing on, and oh, actually real quick, it's interesting that Joseph Smith also was not English as some have supposed, but his DNA was Scottish. He came from the Smith line from Scotland, and he was actually royal royalty of Scotland. So it's interesting. He's one of my great cousins. <laughs> um, because I'm also Scottish royalty. Anyway, it's just all fun stuff to figure out and to, to learn about. But anyway, uh, let me see here. Okay, here we go. Alone in... A man's honor and glory is obtained by women. Alone and single, men fade into insignificance. But through women and children, his glory is extended and perpetuated. For this reason, Paul said that the woman is the glory of man. And quote 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 7. Jesus was not the exception to this principle. Before he died, he said to the Father, quote, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. John chapter 17, verses 1 and 4. The Lord continued to reveal further light on this subject in the revelation to the prophet when he said, For they are given unto him to multiply and replenish the earth according to my commandment and to fulfill the promise which was given by my father before the foundation of the world and for their exaltation in the eternal worlds that they might bear the souls of men. For herein is the work of my Father continued, that he might be glorified. This promise is yours also, because ye are of Abraham. And the promise was made unto Abraham, and by this law is the continuation of the works of my Father, wherein he glorified himself. Go ye therefore and do the works of Abraham, enter into my law, and ye shall be saved. Doctrine and Covenant, section 132, verses 63, 31, and 32. Hence, God is glorified by the commandment to multiply and replenish the earth. It is evident Jesus had a posterity by his admission that he glorified the Father on the earth. The grand blessing of honor which was given to Abraham was his family and his posterity. This was the glory of Abraham. Page 86. But to continue with the scripture of Isaiah, quote, What did the old prophet mean when he said, speaking of Christ, he shall see his seed and prolong his days, etc.? 
Did Jesus consider it necessary to fulfill every righteous command or requirement of his Father? He most certainly did. This he witnessed by submitting to baptism under the hands of John. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, is what he said. It was God's command to man in the beginning to multiply and replenish the earth. None can deny this, neither was it neither that it was a righteous command, for upon an obedience to this depended the perpetua uh, the perpe- perpetuity perpetuity <laughs> of our race. Did Christ come to destroy the law or the prophets or to fulfill them or to live them perfectly? He came to fulfill. Did he multiply, and did he see his seed? Did he honor his father's law by complying with it, or did he not? Others may do as they like, but I will not charge our Savior with neglect or transgression in this or any other duty. End quote. The Apostle Orson Hyde, Journal of Discourses, Volume 4, page 260. When Christ came in the meridian of time, he came to fulfill all of the gospel laws. He further fulfilled all of the ancient prophecies concerning the life of the promised Messiah. Isaiah the prophet saw the Messiah seated upon the throne of the temple. And the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In this instance, the train was not a robe, for it filled the temple. This train implies more than just disciples. The term referred to the relation or family members, and this was the interpretation taken by the uh, President Brigham Young. Page 87. The scripture says that he, the Lord, came walking in the temple with his train. I do not know who they were unless his wives and children. Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses, Volume 13, page 309. That he did take upon himself the responsibilities of a family is also inferred by the Apostle Paul, who said that he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Or some Pat Pratt refers to the scripture as follows. For the passage in the 45th Psalm, it will be seen that the great Messiah, who was the founder of the Christian religion, was a polygamist, as well as the patriarch Jacob and the prophet David, from whom he descended according to the flesh. Paul says concerning Jesus, quote, Verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16. Abraham the polygamist, being the friend of God, the Messiah chose to take upon him his seed by marrying many honorable wives himself. Show to all future generations that he approbated the plurality of wives under the Christian dispensation as well as under the dispensation in which his polygamous ancestors lived. We have now clearly shown that God the Father had a plurality of wives, one or more being in eternity, by whom he begat our spirits as well as the spirits of Jesus his firstborn, and another being upon the head, I'm sorry, and another being upon the earth by whom he begat the tabernacle of Jesus as his only begotten in this world. We have also proved most clearly that the son followed the example of his father and became the great bridegroom to whom kings, daughters, and many honorable wives were to be married. We have also proved that both God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ inherited their wives in eternity 
as well as in time, and that God the Father has already begotten many thousand millions of sons and daughters and sent them into the this world to take upon them tabernacles that they I'm sorry, that God the Son has promised that the increase of his government there shall be no end. It being expressly declared that the children of one of his queens should be made princes in all the earth. See Psalms chapter 45 verse 16 and also Orson Pratt the Seer page 172 we on page 88 of Jesus was married. As Jesus entered the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew of the conspiracy of death that loomed upon the near horizon. Diabolical men and demons were allying their means and pro- powers to destroy the pr- prospects of the Son of God. And with this premonition, Jesus sank to his knees and cried, No no mortal man, no human heart ever felt the anguish, the sorrow, and the despair that came from that little garden, that lonely night. And why? Because he prayed and felt, as a mortal man, that a husband and a father, he loved his home as dear as any man ever loved a home. He knew the warmth of a family's love besides the fireplace, the smiles and laughter of his children, the tender embrace of a loving wife. Was there ever a blessing or a joy in the human heart that he should be deprived of? Conversely, was there ever a sorrow, a pain, or an anguish that other men had suffered that he too must not share. With the seeds of mortality coursing through the veins of Jesus, he had experienced the emotions and feelings of every other mortal. Yet with a nature that was divine, he neither sinned nor erred. Nor No mortal was ever more entitled to a home and a family than he. No man had greater reason to remain alive than did Jesus, and for this he prayed. Death could could deprive him of all these deserving blessings. In a gushing of tears and sweat, he was pleading to his father for the continuation of his life. He loved his wives and his children and his disciples, And in the despair of leaving them, he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. In the darkness of the night, in the blackness of his future, he attempted to arouse his apostles three times to assist him in the petition for his life. And he cried, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Mark chapter 14, verse 36, page 89. His soul was torn between the affectionate ties on the earth and the will of his Father in heaven. But like many of God's prophets who had been robbed of their homes and families to perish in the prime of life, so too Jesus must suffer through the same trial and temptation. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, and yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Attention must again be drawn to the revelation of March of 1839 to the Prophet Joseph Smith during his incarceration at Liberty Jail. The Lord indicates this trial of Joseph's was for his good and would give him experience, then indicates that he too has undergone the same sorrow, heartfelt sorrow, of being separated from his offspring and also much worse 
If thou art accused with all manner of false accusations, if thine enemies fall upon thee, if they tear thee from the society of thy father and mother and brethren and sisters, and if with a drawn sword thine enemies tear thee from the bosom of thy wife and thine offspring, and thine elder son, although but six years of age, shall cling to thy garment and shall say, My father, my father, why can't you stay with us? Oh, hey, my father, what are the men going to do with you? And if then he shall be thrust from thee by the sword, and thou dragged into prison, and thine enemies prowl around thee like wolves for the blood of the lamb, know thou, my son, that all these things shall be shall give thee experience, and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man hath descended below them all, Art thou greater than he? Doctrine and Covenant, section 122, verses 6, 7, and 8. Understanding the feelings of the heart can only be obtained by experience, as the taste of salt and sugar cannot be known but by the taste of the tongue, so also the joys and sorrows of the heart be known by the experience. Jesus knew happiness, sorrow, disappointment, and every other emotion and feeling of a husband, a father, and a man. Page 90. He experienced them with them all that he might understand our feelings and lead us to eternal life. In the light of new revelation and the new archaeological findings, these little known facts are finding their way to discovery. In 1875, an archaeologist by the name of Gianu discovered these facts in ancient records. The written commentary of the learned M. Z- Z- Udili <laughs> are most revealing. Quote, Did Jesus have children? There seems to be evidence that much was the case. In 1870C, M. Claremont Gianu discovered near Bethany on the Mount of Offense certain sarcophagal sarcophagi in extremely ancient times. On these were small crosses, but none of the usual symbols of Jewish burials, which leaves no doubt of the religion of the persons whose remains were preserved in them. M. Claremont Gianu, writing of these discoveries in the Palestine Exploration Fund, quarterly, 1874, pages 7 through 10, notes the following to have been buried there, Salome, wife of Judah, Judah the son of Eleazar, who is Lazarus, Eleazar the son of Nathan, Martha the son of Pesach, Simeon, son of Jesus, Solomon, daughter of Simeon. Other sarcophagi had been destroyed early, earlier, concerning the writings of Claremont Gianu, by singular coincidence, singular coincidence, which from the first struck me very forcibly. These inscriptions found close to the Bethany Road, very near the site of the village containing nearly all of the names of personages in the gospel scene which belonged to the place of Eleazar or Lazarus. So Lazarus is the transliteration of Eleazar. Um, We know him as Lazarus, but in the Hebrew tongue, Lazarus's true name was Eleazar. Anyway, Simeon, Martha, and a host of other coincidences occur at the site of all these evangelical names. The Simeon, son of Jesus, was called in one of the inscriptions, the priest or the Koan, the Koan, and Claremont. So he was a priest of 
the Christians, or a Cohen of the Christians. So Cohen means priest. And M. Claremont Gianu concluded this Simeon might very well be the second bishop of Jerusalem. And went and then would arise the grave question of the marriage of the Christian priests, since Simeon has a daughter named Salam Zion. We're on page ninety one. And Clermont Guianu, a uh, French name, would suggest him to be Catholic and bound to the doctrines of celibacy. However, the first 15 bishops of Jerusalem were circumcised Jews, and the earlier ones at least certainly be- obeyed the marriage commandments. That's because the first 15 bishops of, of Jerusalem were not uh, part of the hijacked you know, Rome didn't hijack the church until later, and then when they hijacked the church, many things changed. Because uh, they continued to keep the Torah, they continued to keep the law. Jesus says, I do not come to do away with one sm- of the smallest parts of the law or the Torah. Anyway, continuing on. It seems the only reason Claremont Guiano did not candidly state his belief was the question of a married clergy. For throughout his article, he suggests the Simeon to have been the Bishop of Jerusalem. He promised to write a complete paper on the subject when he had more carefully examined all the find. It was an important find from the standpoint of archaeology, for it was the first actual discovery of the name Martha, which would alone be sufficient to make this collection important from an exogenic point of view. Yet his promised paper was never published. Why? Was it because a full study of the find disclosed that the Simeon, son of Jesus, was the Bishop of Jerusalem? I fully believe this to be the case. Orthodox Christians have purposely destroyed valuable historical evidences which would prove embarrassing to them that such is was probably the case here, is suggesting by the fact that several ancient writers imply that Simeon, the Bishop of Jerusalem, and the President of the Church died in 106 AD and was the family of Jesus himself. It would be only natural for Jesus' son when he was old enough to succeed James, the brother of the Lord, on his death to the presidency of the church. In all probability, Simeon was a son of Jesus and Martha and was the child who appeared at the crucifixion. Other ancient manuscripts may have been found which would contribute additional evidences concerning the marriage and the family of Jesus. However, our present attitudes forbid validity and disclosure upon such evidence because they tear asunder all of our homespun traditional teachings. Page 92. Historical sources may yet someday bring further light and information on this subject. From an ecclesiastical point of view, we know that Jesus came to honor, teach, and obey the laws of the priesthood. And when Jesus became a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, according to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20, He obeyed every law and ordinances pertaining to that order and priesthood. Not only did he sustain those laws, but he became the perfect example for others to follow in like manner. One of the primary laws of this priesthood order was for the priest to bear children. It was essential for man who bore the priesthood to have a continuation of seed by bearing children under that covenant. A high priest who had no children was considered accursed, while those who had, who had numerous posterity were called blessed. The children who were born under the covenant of the priesthood were blessed with the fatherly or patriarchal blessing. Prophecies were uttered upon their heads for their future 
and the future of their posterity for many generations. Isaiah prophesied concerning the posterity of Jesse, the father of King David, and that from his loins should come someone known as the stem, another as the rod, and one is the branch. So there's the stem, the root, the rod, and the branch. There's four Davidic servants. That's Isaiah chapter 11, by the way. The identity of this person was sought for by the prophet Joseph Smith, who inquired of the Lord. The disclosure disclosure concerning the stem was made known in the following revelation. Okay, this is going to drive me nuts. I'm going to read the revelation, and we're going to talk about it for a minute. Joseph Smith, who is the stem of Jesse, spoken of in the first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth verses of the eleventh chapter of Isaiah. Verily thus saith the Lord, it is Christ. Doctrine and Covenants, section 113, verses 1 through 2. Since Christ was identified as the stem, it is interesting to note that the stem was to have posterity, according to Isaiah, for there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of, stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Okay, I got to talk about this for a minute because Moroni, when he first appeared to Joseph Smith, he quoted this scripture, Isaiah chapter 11. He also quoted a, a scripture in Joel, and he also quoted um, Acts chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, I believe. And Moroni said that that man of Acts chapter Uh, chapter 3 was Christ but the day had not yet come when he would be rejected by his people (sighs) so let's unpack this real quick Acts chapter 3 is talking about the man likened to Moses now Jesus Christ was a man likened to Moses but Jesus Christ had already been rejected by his people When Moroni says that the man of Acts chapter 3 is a Christ or a Messiah, but the day had not yet come when he would be rejected by his people, it's not speaking of Messiah ben Judah. It's speaking of Messiah ben Joseph, who would come at a future time than that, who would be rejected by his people. It is by the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word is established. Zechariah chapter 4 speaks of the two anointed ones, or messiahs, that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. These two witnesses are Messiah ben Judah, the first witness and apostle of the Father, and Messiah ben Joseph, the second witness and apostle of the Father. Jesus Christ had come to his people in the meridian of time, and he had been rejected by his people at that time. But Moroni said to Joseph Smith that the man of Acts chapter 3 had not yet been rejected by his people, speaking of Messiah ben Joseph. For those of you that believe that Joseph Smith was the Messiah ben Joseph, he also had not and was not rejected by his people. There are six million LDS people today that come from people that did not reject Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith is not Messiah ben Joseph. But when Jesus Christ answers Joseph Smith about who the stem is, Jesus Christ doesn't say, I am the stem. He doesn't say Jesus is the stem. He simply says a title that verily I say unto you, the stem is Christ. Or in other words, the stem is a messiah. When Moroni came to Joseph Smith in 1829, 
I think no, I think it was actually before that. But anyway, whatever year year it was, Moroni said that those things were about to happen. Isaiah chapter eleven was about to happen. Acts chapter three, speaking of the man likened to Moses, that that man was Christ or is a Messiah, Messiah ben Joseph. But the day had not yet come when he would be rejected by his people. His people are of the tribe of Ephraim and Joseph, because he is a Messiah, which means anointed one. A lot of people don't understand. Like the LDS Church really screws up the meaning of what it means to be a prophet, because we're all supposed to be prophets. It's how we get revelation to be guided by the Spirit as prophets, and God is no respecter of persons. But the Messiah, a Messiah, is an anointed one. Now, Jesus Christ was the Messiah and an only begotten, who is the Savior of the world. But Cyrus by uh, in Isaiah was also called the Messiah, or an anointed one of God, who delivered his people from the bondage of, of ba- uh, Babylon the Great. Jesus Christ delivered us from the bondage of death and hell, which is what a Messiah does. And I will deliver the people from the bondage of ignorance and Babylon as well as Messiah ben Joseph, as a second witness of the Father. And yes, I'm telling you that I have seen the Savior and the Father face to face and am an eyewitness of the Father and the Son. And Moroni was talking about that man had not been rejected by his people. You are my people. And for the most part, you reject me. And that prophecy is fulfilled. But there will be a small remnant, according to Isaiah, who will accept these things. And it will be that remnant or those wise virgins who will be the ones who come through the tribulation and the redemption and become those who help redeem Zion. Continuing on at page 93, this was evident that the stem would, or Christ would have children because these great servants known as the rod and the branch were to come forth through his lineage. That's an interpretation of scripture. And Peter talked about scripture is not for private interpretation, but we all do it. We're all guilty of it, but this is an interpretation Ogden had. Anyway, but I am going to continue reading Ogden because I do value his opinion, even if I know that he's wrong sometimes. So, the rod has been identified as the prophet Joseph Smith. Prophecies designate the rod as one of one who would hold the keys of the kingdom for an ensign and for a gathering of my people in the last days, according to Doctrine and Covenants, section 113, verse 6. See, these are opinions. These are speculations. And I don't even know what to say about that. Because when I saw the father face to face and he laid his hands upon my head he actually gave me all the keys to the kingdom and the priesthood when he laid his physical hands upon my physical head and I became anointed under his very hands and became an eyewitness and apostle of the father he gave me those keys anyway continuing and Isaiah said that he should be the means of establishing an ensign to the people And to it shall the Gentiles seek. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. Since Joseph Smith did hold the keys of the kingdom in the last days, according to Doctrine and Covenants section 64, verse 5, 65, verse 2, and 115, verse 19, and was the rod from the loins of the stem of Jesse, he would have had the blood of Abraham, Jesse, and the Savior according to the testimony of Scripture and Revelation. It would be evident that Joseph Smith would also be known, or also, 
it would be evident that Joseph Smith should also know these facts. The prophet didn't understand them and more, but he was reluctant to tell them because of the traditions and the ideologies of modern Christianity. He once hinted, and this drives me absolutely insane, because they come to these conclusions, and this is fundamentalist, this is where Ogden is getting this from, and even though Joseph Smith never says any of this stuff, but they've come to these conclusions. So when they, when Joseph gives this, they're like, see, he was trying to tell us. No, he wasn't. But <laughs> we're going to read it anyway. Joseph Smith did say this. Would to God, brethren, I could tell you who I am. Would to God I could tell you what I know. But you would call it blasphemy and you would want to take my life. Joseph Smith, and this is recorded in the life of Heber C. Kimball, pages 333. But the royal blood lineage of the prophets and the Savior was not confirmed to the select individuals described by Isaiah. Other notable leaders, such as those chosen to assist in the restoration of the gospel in these last days, were also instilled with the blood and spirit of their Lord, and these valiant souls were commissioned to establish this ensign for the work of gathering my people in the last days. And this radio show is an ensign. This podcast is an ensign. It goes throughout the whole earth. The whole earth. And you are called to gather to where I am. And very few will listen. You'll stay out and babble on the grave because you don't believe these things. But your blood is not upon my shoulders. I've given the warning time and time again that this is the place where God is calling calling us to gather here in Emory County, Utah. And that when things get too dangerous because everything has fallen apart, that we will go into the highways of the top of the mountains as Isaiah saw, and that we will go into the desert places where God has prepared a place for us to ride out the storm as everything else falls apart around us. And that Isaiah chapter 35 talks about Zion being born in the wilderness and in the desert places. Well, I know exactly where Isaiah saw these things happen because I am the man who was chosen to lead the people into those places to be the man like unto Moses, whether people accept it or not. But it's not my problem if you don't accept it. I'm just telling you what I've been told. So, Among the notable and valiant leaders of this past dispensation was President Heber C. Kimball. Here was a noble man, a prophet, and a true apostle of Jesus Christ who possessed all of the powers and gifts of the ancient apostles. Page 94. i got to say something real quick. Some believe that I am the return of Joseph Smith. Whether I am or not makes no difference. God says it's by their fruits that you shall know him or know them that follow God. What I do now is more important than who I was before. And my job is to teach they who had been weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast and to be a witness of the Father and the Son, and I am. And also, there's a sealing ordinance that is part of the law of adoption, where when I was sealed up to the Father and to, uh, to the Father and was given eternal life, I became a link on the earth, and those who are sealed to me through the law of adoption, they are sealed through me to the Father and to the Son. (laughs) 
And that's why, one of the reasons why I have been sealed up to the Father and the Son, and that is one of the reasons why I've seen them face to face. And all of that is so that the house of God can be set in order. Not the church, not some branch of the church, but the house of God on the earth. Continuing on. Here was a noble man, a prophet, a true apostle of Jesus Christ, who possessed all of the powers and gifts of the ancient apostles. <laughs> I gotta say this. Do you know how Jesus Christ is called an apostle? Well, who is he an apostle of? Jesus Christ was the first witness and apostle of the Father. He was an eyewitness of the Father. And it is by the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word is established. There are two witnesses of the Father. Zechariah chapter 4 talks about them, that there are two anointed ones or two messiahs or witnesses of the Father, who is the Lord of the whole earth. The story of his life, his character, and his labors was patterned after the similitude of the Savior. The spiritual gifts and the endowments which God had blessed him with became so abundantly manifest that thousands flocked to hear and to see this Latter-day Prophet. On one occasion in England, crowds of people greeted him with flowers, songs, and offering of kindness. Okay, Joseph Smith never went to England, so I don't know what this is talking about. I'll just continue on. The Apostle Orson F. Whitney commented on this occasion by making a parallel of the life of the Savior. Quote, a rare scene indeed and suggestive one that the parallel of which the mind must leap backwards nigh 2,000 years. On the next day, much people were to come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, and branches of palm trees went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that actually is Sukkot, or the, the festival of tabernacles and like Jesus Christ, he obeyed and kept the feasts of Jehovah that are in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, in the Torah. And we're supposed to be keeping the same thing. In fact, it's not required that we keep Hanukkah. It's a memorial celebration. And the next one is Purim, which is another memorial celebration. But there are seven actual feasts of Jehovah that we are supposed to keep. And this one that Jesus was talking about was actually in the fall, and it was the festival of Sukkot. So, anyway, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world has gone after him. So was it with the servant of Christ, this brother of Jesus in the British Isles. The hireling and Pharisees of Christendom prevailed nothing. The word went after him, whole villages at a sweep, single praises and shouting in tones of rapture. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. There was divine harmony in all of this. In Heber, his character, manner, and methods, we say it was reverently, there was much of of the Christ that might of the might of the of the lion and the meekness of the lamb. His also was the Savior's lineage. In his heart was a kindred spirit. In his veins the self same blood. Where causes are similar, should there not sp spring similar results? Life of Huber C. Kimball, 
page 185. So we're on page 95 now. Heber C. Kimball understood the paternal nature of this ancient blood royalty. At a conference in 1857, he was impressed to publicly reveal information concerning his sacred lineage, and perhaps he knew the time had arrived when these things should be made known for the light and understanding of the saints. If they could comprehend and treasure this information, it would inspire them to live a more saintly life. Are you ever going to be prepared to see God, Jesus Christ, his angels, or comprehend his servants unless you take a faithful and prayerful course? Did you actually know Joseph Smith? No. Do you know Brother Brigham? No. Do you know Brother Heber? No, you do not. Do you know the Twelve? You do not. If you did, you would begin to know God and learn that those men who are chosen to direct and counsel you are near kindred to God and to Jesus Christ. The keys, powers, and authority of God of the kingdom of God are in that lineage. Heber C. Kimball, Journal of Discourses, Volume 4, page 248. The prophet Joseph Smith had previously and privately revealed some of these things to a few selected individuals. It was in the early 1840s that Joseph made a similar disclosure. While visiting with Zena, she related a conversation that occurred between her and Sister Repshire upon the events in Nauvoo when the prophet Joseph Smith sealed her, her sister Repshire, to a Judge Adams of Springfield, Illinois. The prophet stated that her, Rep. Shire, that Judge Adams was not was a literal descendant of Jesus Christ. The judge died in Nauvoo, and the sister Rep. Shire, his wife, who had been married before to Rep. Shire, died at Hill Creek, Utah, and that is according to the Oliver B. Hunting Journal, Huntington. Journal, page 259, and uh, I actually live pretty close to the town of Huntington, which is named after him in Emory County, which is where the gathering is. Anyway, we're on page 96. In a solemn assembly held in the Salt Lake City Temple on July 2nd, 1899, more information pertaining to the descendants of Christ was divulged. The Apostle George Q. Cannon made this disclosure after which the president of the church, Lorenzo Snow, confirmed his statement, quote, President George Q. Cannon also spoke on the law of tithing. Among the other things he said, there are those in these in this audience who are descendants of the old twelve apostles, and shall I say it? Yes, the descendants of the Savior himself. His seed is represented in this body of men. Following President Cannon, President Snow arose and said that that brother Cannon had had stated respecting the literal descendants upon the company of the old apostles and the Savior himself is true. The Savior's seed is represented in this body of men and quote Journal of President Rudger Clausen page 374 and 375 But Kimball, Young, Adams, and other apostles were not the only exception in this possessing the literal blood of Christ. Other members of the church and the congregation were also descendants of this grand royalty. There There are men in this congregation who are the descendants of the ancient twelve apostles, and shall I say it? 
of the Son of God himself, for he had seed, and in the right time they shall be known. End quote. Anthony W. Ivan's journal, page 21. What became of the descendants and the children of Jesus? Would they not, in Abraham's seed, be a blessing to all of the nations of the earth? According to the prophecy, the choicest seed of the earth will be gathered in the last days to prepare for the second coming of the Savior. The Apostle Orson Hyde commented on this blood lineage, and we're on page 97. Here's the quote. We say it was Jesus Christ who was married to be brought into the relation whereby he could see his seed or his children before he was crucified. And that's according to Isaiah chapter 53. He or has he indeed passed by the nature of angels and taken upon himself the seed of Abraham to die without leaving a seed to bear his name on the earth? No, but when the secret is fully out, the seed of the blush shall be gathered in. In the last days, he who has not the blood of Abraham flowing in his veins, who has not one particle of the Savior in him, I am afraid of this stereotypical Gentile who will be, on, who will be left out and not be gathered in the last days. For I tell you, it is the chosen of God and the seed of the blessed that shall be gathered. I do not despise to be called the son of Abraham, for he had a dozen wives, or to be called the brother, a son, a child of the Savior. If he had Mary and Martha and several others as his wives, And though he did cast seven devils out of one of them, it is all the same to me. Well then, he shall see his seed, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the earth. I shall say here that before the Savior died, He looked upon his own natural children as we look upon ours, and he saw his seed, and immediately afterwards he was cut off from the earth. But who shall declare his generation? They had no father to hold them in honorable remembrance. They passed into the shades of obscurity, never to be exposed to mortal eye as the seed of the Blessed One. For no doubt they had been exposed to the eye of the world. Those infants might have shared in the same fate as the children of Jerusalem in the days of Herod, when all the children were ordered to be slain under such an age, with the hopes of slaying the infant Savior. History is replete with circumstances of neck-or-nothing politicians dyeing their hands in the blood of those who stood in their way to the throne or to the power. Page 98. That seed has had its influence upon the chosen of God in these last days. The same spirit inspires them that inspires their father who bled and died upon the cross after the manner of the flesh. End quote. Orson Hyde, Journal of Discourses, Volume 2, page 82 and 83. Two years later, this learned apostle again continued to expound on the blessings of this chosen seed. Quote, Abraham was chosen of God for the purpose of raising up a chosen seed and a peculiar people under his name. Jesus Christ was sent into the world for a similar purpose, but upon a more extended scale. Christ was the seed of Abraham, so reckoned. Christ was the seed of Abraham, so reckoned. 
to these great promises were made, one of which was that in Abraham and his seed, which was Christ, all of the families of the earth should be blessed. When? When the ungodly or those not of their seed should be cut off from the earth and no family remaining on the earth except their own seed. Then in Abraham and in Christ and all the families and kindreds of the earth be blessed, Satan bound and the millennium fully come. Then the meek will inherit the earth and God's elect reign undisturbed at least for 1,000 years. Is there no way provided for those to come into this co- uh, covenant relation who may not possess in their veins any of the blood of Abraham or of Christ? Yes, by doing the works of Abraham and of Christ in the faith of Abraham and of Christ, not in unbelief, and unrighteousness, like the wicked world, who have damned themselves in their own corruption and unbelief. And quote Orson High, Journal of Discourses, Volume 4, page 260. What would today's ministers of Christianity say about Jesus if he came into our society traveling with a large group of women? What would they say if they saw him eating and staying overnight in the home of a couple of young women. Page 99. Our modern ministers think that Mary of Magdalene was a prostitute and considered Christ's association with her and relationship as more acceptable than if she were a wife. And the whole idea that Mary was a prostitute is a lie that came about after the hijacking of the Christian church. Mary Magdalene did not have seven devils in her. She was caught up to the seventh heaven, which they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't say it. Because they had to change things. Anyway, continuing on. We're almost done with this chapter, by the way. It takes a special bot bending of the mind to reach some of the conclusions of our counterfeit Christian ministry. It is certainly more respectful to Christ to consider his association with Mary as a wife rather than a prostitute, and scriptural evidence leans more towards that conclusion. It is strange indeed to think that Jesus should be able to understand and obey or to fulfill every law and commandment of God, yet be exempt from obeying the law which commands man to multiply and replenish the earth. So that is the last part of this chapter. We're on page 99. I will be posting this not only in fundamentally Mormon my podcast but also on Facebook and in different places on Facebook and I will be posting this text that I've been reading to Tumblr to uh, tumblr.com forward slash fundamentally Mormon so that you can read it for yourself And there will be a link in uh, when I share this on the uh, the audio recording uh, down in the bottom of the description. I'll have a link there for all of this. So anyway, that is the end of this chapter. And when we come back on, we will be on the last chapter of Jesus was married. And then we'll have to get into another book. But this is one of my favorite books. So I'm very glad to be able to have read it to you. And I hope that you will get revelation for yourself and confirmation of the Holy Spirit that you can know that the Book of Mormon is true and that Joseph Smith was God's prophet 
and that Jesus Christ stands on the right hand of God, that he is the first witness and apostle of the Father, and he has declared truth by sending his prophet Joseph Smith to testify of him and to bring you into the fold that you may be brought to the Father and live. And I say these things in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, even Jesus the Christ. Amen.